Um, I'm going to introduce myself anyway. I'm Ashley, and we did our project on New Zealand, starting an interior design firm in New Zealand. So uh, business laws and practices, banking and taxation, all vary from country to country. Business in New Zealand generally uses one of three structures, a sole trader, a partnership, or a limited liability. A sole trader controls, manages, and owns a business and is entitled to all the profits. A partnership is more common for professional people in the farming industry. Uh, the partnership itself does not pay income tax. Instead, they separate all the profit, um, give it to each partner, and then the partner will pay uh, personal tax on that. Um, finally, a limited liability is the most successful of the business structure in New Zealand uh, because it fosters confidence in business by governing relationships between investors and stakeholders. Uh, you can register a company online through the company's office for a fee of 150 New Zealand dollars. Each territory has its own rules and regulations about what business activity is allowed in each area. This is called a local authority, and essentially it's um, similar to zoning regulations here in the U.S., meaning like you can't build commercial in a residential area, likewise you can't build commercial or residential in a commercial area. Uh -huh. uh, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand offers, oversees the banking system of New Zealand. This is similar to the Federal Reserve, um, it formulates and implements monetary policy, monitors banks, manages currency. Um, unlike here in America where we have the FDIC which backs our money, um, in New Zealand it's kind of a banking at your own risk. So there's no insurance backing um, of bank's money. If you lose it, if you lose it, it's gone. Um, opening a bank account as a foreigner is easy. All you need is um, the right documents, so a valid passport, a visa, um, proof of and proof of resident. If you are intending on moving to New Zealand and you don't have a residential address yet, you can um, still apply online as long as you have a working visa available to you. So next we're going to talk about the political climate in New Zealand. Um, that's the same as it was for us. New Zealand was colonized by the UK. Um, their political climate is a constitution, constitutional monarchy, uh, meaning their rule is under the queen, uh, as pictured on the left or right, whatever that is for you. Um, however, they are governed by the New Zealand Prime Minister, and her name is Jacinda Ardern. Alrighty, so a little bit about um, immigration regulations to when you want to start up your business. Uh, firstly, the 2016 World Bank Doing Business Survey says, New Zealand is the easiest country in the world to do business in and the easiest place in the world to start a business. And as shown here, you can see that on a report score of out of 100 points, New Zealand scores 99.96% on how easy it is to start a business. So I think that's pretty great. When you're wanting to start your business in New Zealand as a foreigner, you need to apply for what's called an entrepreneurial work visa. And this, is, um, this gives you residence and uh, a visa for up to three years. And this can be divided into two different stages. The first stage is called a startup stage and it is 12 months long. It allows you to get your business started. The second stage is called the balance stage and it's the remaining 24 months. And it's granted to you once you have earned uh, 120 points on a point-based system for business. You've invested at least 100,000 New Zealand dollars into your business. Uh, you have um, you have a clear business plan, and you have a clear history of bankruptcy, business failure, and fraud. And you've also met health, character, and English language requirements. Once you are looking for a place to live in New Zealand with an entrepreneurial work visa, you can apply for what's called an entrepreneurial work um, residence category, which grants you residence um, to live permanently if you have a high growth and an export potential. And there's two different ways you can go about doing this. You can do it in the typical route, which is to get this in two years. And uh, you have to have successfully established or purchased a new business in New Zealand. And uh, it has to be significantly important to New Zealand and beneficial. You actually, and you also have to be self-employed in that business for those two years. The other route is a fast track. It's six months long. Um, instead of the two years, you have to invest at least 500,000 New Zealand dollars in this business and you have to create at least three full-time jobs for New Zealand citizens or residents. 
Rules governing uh, foreign investors owning property or business. So New Zealand is an open economy that works on free market principles. What a free market is, it means that price for goods and services are determined by the open market and by the consumer. Um, New Zealand's economy is dependent on foreign investment. Uh, New Zealand has essentially laid the welcome mat for foreign investors uh, through rewards, offering incentives, and a stable business economy. For example, um, stable and robust growth as much as 2.9% in 2017, uh, free movement of capital, as well as simple, a simple and attractive tax system such as 100% deductibility for research and development. Um, the overseas investment regime regulates investment by an overseas person. So an overseas person is basically just somebody who is not a citizen of New Zealand and not ordinarily a resident of New Zealand, or it's a company that is at least 25% owned by um, someone from overseas. Uh, the overseas regime is a consenting regime rather than a prohibiting regime. So they basically just decide who needs to obtain consent when consent is required and the process for obtaining consent. The Overseas Investment Act of 2018 ensures that overseas investment benefit New Zealand. Um, so under this act, it requires overseas buyers to seek approval from the Overseas Investment Office, or the OIO. Um, it restricts FDI in areas such as sensitive and sensitive land areas and housing. FDI is foreign direct investment. Sensitive land can be farmland, um, at a seabed, or uh, by the ocean side. They also use a counterfactual test, uh, which basically determines the benefit of New Zealand by projecting where that investment will lead um, in the future. They also consider if your investment is on special land, so foreshore, seabed, riverbed. Um, if it is on special land, the land must be offered to the Crown before it is invested in, and if she doesn't want it, then you can invest in it. Um, they also consider if it's farmland, again, it must be offered to New Zealand on the open market as farmland is considered um, special and is usually safe for agriculture, horticulture, uh, the keeping of bees, uh, poultry, and livestock. And they also consider if the investment will increase um, the population of New Zealand fish and aquatic life as well as seaweed. They also consider if you have the necessary business experience, if you've dis dis demonstrated financial commitment to the investment, um, if you have good character and if you've been imprisoned or not. If you are not a New Zealand resident, you need approval from the OIO for purchases of more than five hectares of land. This is similar to the regulations of starting a business. It essentially affirms what you're using the land for and grants you permission. Um, restrictions apply to what you can do on farmland, seabed, riverbeds, etc. Um, the options for buying a commercial property in New Zealand include buying as an individual, uh, as a partnership, through a company, or through a trust. In New Zealand, you need a lawyer to purchase property. So with your lawyer and your business advisor, you would decide what um, way of purchasing is the best for you, and they'll also get you uh, the best deal possible. Um, so this slide is talking about limitations in money coming in and out of the country. Uh, so as we discussed previously, New Zealand is an open market economy, uh, but there are a few limitations. There, let me say there are, sorry, there are very few limitations on where and how you can invest. Um, one of the big limitations is the government requires consent for investments of assets of more than 100 million New Zealand dollars or 66 million US dollars. And it's important to note that one New Zealand dollar is equal to 0.66 US dollars, so 66 cents. All right, now um, we're talking about restrictions on foreigners owning property. First, I'm going to go a little bit more towards the commercial side, then I'm going to talk about residential. To explain this graphic up here, um, the OIO is the Overseas Investment Office, and this graphic shows you if you need consent from them to buy or purchase land um, or uh, you know, property. Um, this category right here is other overseas people, which is what we would consider to be as a foreign business entrepreneur. So if you look over developing residential land, we need consent, buying forestry, we need consent, yada yada. Uh, from an immigration standpoint, when you want to buy commercial land for your business, there's not really any restrictions. As long as you have your entrepreneur work visa, you're good to buy any commercial land property as long as it's not over the, the education on the pictures. 
Um, but you might need to apply with the OIO office, the Overseas Investment Office, if you're wishing to acquire land that is uh, sensitive land, a business shares over uh, business assets worth more than $100 million, or a fishing quota. If you meet any of those requirements, then you have to get consent from the uh, Overseas Investment Office. Now, on the residential side, previously the housing market has been open to investors worldwide, but recently, in August of 2018, the um, local government has um, passed legislation that allows only New Zealand residents to um, purchase property, uh, residential property, uh, as it tries to tackle the runaway housing crisis. Uh, so the housing market has really boomed, it's gotten very expensive, and in order to try to help, we are, they are um, limiting who exactly can buy houses there. The Associate Finance Minister, David Parker, says, this government believes that New Zealanders should not be outbid by wealthier foreign buyers, whether it's a beautiful lakeside or oceanfront estate, or modern, modest suburban house, this law ensures that the market for our homes is set in New Zealand, not on the international market. Of course, this has been um, counteracted with a little bit of backlash because, you know, what about the foreigners coming in? Where are they going to live? Why can't they build homes? But the whole point behind it is to try to give New Zealanders a chance to not be outbid by the wealthier and be able to buy their own homes. Tax regime and any laws governing wages. Um, so if you're earning income in New Zealand, you need to make sure you apply for an IRD number. An IRD number is an Inland Revenue Department number. Um, it's used for all tax and business details. Um, you'll need an IRD number to register as an employer if you're selling goods and services and if you're buying property in New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand uses the PAYE system, which means pay as you earn uh, for taxes. So uh, this means tax is de deducted by your employer before payments are made to you. Um, your employer then pays the tax deducted on your behalf. Um, then this, and you would pay the PAYE tax system whether or not you're a resident in New Zealand, as long as you're performing services in New Zealand. Um, there's also a GST tax, which is goods and service tax which is imposed on almost all goods and services from New Zealand and is uh, typically 15%. Um, employees are also must be paid in cash, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, if they, it, they must be paid in cash unless their um, employer is the crown or they explicitly um, in writing tell their employer, like I would like a direct deposit or I would like to receive my check. Um, the employer is not allowed to tell you how you can receive your money, so if you don't give them any notification, you'll be paid in cash every week. Um, the adult minimum wage for New Zealand is $17.10 in New Zealand dollars as of April 1st, 2019, um, which is $11.10 in U.S. dollars. This applies to any employee 16 years of age or older. They also have a starting out minimum wage and a training minimum wage, which is a little different. It is $14.16 in New Zealand dollars. Uh, starting out would be if you haven't worked in the past six months. Um, you're just starting out, so that's what you get paid. Um, and then training minimum wage is um, held, to, held for people who run approved industry programs. So it's not for supervisors who are training other people, and it's not for employees who are undergoing training. Um, otherwise, they would just be paid the adult minimum wage. Um, one of the obligations we would hold as an employer is to stay within the conditions of our visa if we were to start a business in New Zealand. Um, if we have a work visa, it will most likely be tied to our industry in the city where we work, such as like Auckland or um, one of the other cities that are in New Zealand. Um, <laughs> And if we change occupancies, we would have to apply for a variation of conditions first. Um, we must have a visa to stay legal, which obviously you need a visa to stay legal, so there you go. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit more about importing and exporting. These are some interesting looking fish that I um, did not recognize the names of, so I thought it would be interesting to learn a little about uh, local New Zealand fish. Uh, firstly, um, the New Zealand Customs Service outlines uh, the full requirements, so you can always refer to their Customs Service website. Um, the Ministry of Agricultural, Agriculture and Forestry requires that exporters' declarations include statements that any 
wooden crates, shipping containers, cargo pallets be inspected before heading to New Zealand for any signs of insect or fungal infestations. And uh, this information needs to be put with the bills of lading. Uh, the increasing volume of trade and travel is putting a lot of pressure on the biosecurity system in New Zealand. Um, pests and new pests and diseases not only create a lot of harm for humans, but they put a lot of pressure on the uh, agricultural and horticultural production, forestry, tourism, and even international trade, um, mm -hmm. international markets. Some examples of some things that are not allowed to import or export throughout New Zealand without further consent include the Patagonian toothfish, the Antarctic toothfish, and the southern bluefin tuna, which are all pretty ugly looking, <laughs> but that's okay because they're pretty in their own way. Um, also including trout, marine animals such as seals, whales, uh, porpoises, uh, dolphins, chemical weapons, explosives, drugs, dogs, human embryos, um, and uh, hazardous substances and wastes. Oh, um, cultural differences, social mores, and customs of New Zealand. So one of the biggest differences between here and New Zealand is the size of businesses and corporations. A huge number of New Zealand businesses average under 14 employees. That's about half the size of the average uh, business here in America. Um, because of that, 40% of their economic output um, is generated by SMEs, which is small to medium enterprises. Uh, because of that, there's a huge emphasis on teamwork. So instead of having um, several individuals on several projects, you have several teams on uh, multiple projects. You still have to get the same amount of work done. Um, so you're closer to the boss, and it also means you have to kind of have a way of getting along with people. Um, there's a high importance of work-life balance. So New Zealand likes to work hard as much as they like to play hard. Um, they make use of their time outside of work. Um, employers tend to be very sympathetic of people with families. According to the New Zealand Family Commission, 90% of people say their employer would let them take off occasionally for special events involving family, and three quarters rated their work as having a lot, um, a lot or a fair amount of flexibility. Um, importance of dress is also important, obviously. Um, first impressions are a great consideration in New Zealand culture. Um, both men and women are advised to dress conservatively um, and keep their appearance formal, particularly when you meet someone new. Um, new Zealanders are naturally very reserved, so it's important not to be too over-friendly when you first meet someone. Um, punctuality is also a huge part of culture. Being on time is expected and considered very bad manners if you were late without a very good reason. Um, fashionably late is not an option as most things start when they say they're going to start. Um, it's expected that you'll always make an appointment before you have a meeting or if you want to meet with your associates and you should always expect your meetings to have a little bit of small talk before the meetings start. A couple other things, um, normal business hours are uh, Monday through Friday 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. and Saturday from 9 a.m. to 12. Um, dinner is reserved for social interactions only. Lunch is for business. Um, tipping may be refused as tipping is rare. Um, New Zealanders are also super uh, proud of the goods that they produce um, on the island. Um, they have a very boutique quality and attention to detail, so it's, um, it shows your appreciation for the culture if you buy local instead of importing things from other countries. Um, New Zealand also has a noise restriction. Uh, for example, from 10.30 p.m. to 7 a.m. it is illegal to honk your horn, um, and a lot of people don't like to be in, um, to be disturbed in their own home by neighbors' um, loud music or voices. Also, the peace sign in New Zealand, uh, when it's turned this way, is actually very offensive. So if you go there, don't do this to anyone. It means V for victory or <clears throat> up yours. Um, all New Zealand cities and most of their towns have buses. Auckland and Wellington both have city suburban rail services. Um, but the services, such as like railways, are in peak times always pretty good, uh, considering that New Zealand is pretty wide open, therefore their population density is pretty low. Um, this makes it practical to provide an extensive, uh, sorry, this makes it impractical to provide the extensive public transport systems you find in more built up cities, and that is just because the, it is so extensive and there's not so many people that they, they, they can get to. Um, New Zealand roads are genu uh, generally good, 
though some of the roads outside of cities are only two lane highways. It's, again, that's just because of the population density. Um, flying is always a, a popular option given that it's not a very long flight no matter where you go. Um, from Auckland to Wellington is an hour flight compared to an eight hour drive. Uh, Wellington to Christchurch is a 50 minute flight compared to a, a six hour drive. Um, there are two separate islands, the northern and the southern island. You can get there by ferry, that's always popular. Uh, the rail service can also will take you onto the ferry. Uh, takes just pay, uh, people who are walking and um, cars as well on the ferry to get them from the south, the north, north to the south, so on and so forth. And right now we're gonna talk about the general spending habits of the population. Uh, New Zealanders enjoy a really comfortable standard of living and they rank very highly on the Global Happiness Index. Uh, good health, high disposable incomes, low unemployment, and uh, a robust economy really help drive growth in household spending. At the same time, buying behavior and spending attitudes are really being shaped by the aging consumer base, um, a drive for new technology, you know, people want to experience new things, and um, they're really big, uh, they have a really big growing demand for sustainable living there. The data shows that the household debt disposable income was up $6.2 billion in the year to March of 2017, which is a 4.4% increase, which is great. However, uh, spending was up $8.5 billion, which is a 5.9% increase. Uh, overall, households spent $4.1 billion more than they earned in the year. Spending has increased over all categories in the year to March of 2017, with large increases in restaurants and hotels, transport and housing and housing utilities. Um, these figures might reflect the wealth effect that was caused by the hot housing boom in the year to March of 2017. Um, so before we had the limitations on who all could buy residential property in New Zealand, um, you know, farmers were coming in and buying all this property and the sellers would make a lot of money and this created a big wealth boom. And uh, since then they created legislature saying that um, only New Zealanders can purchase property and uh, that might have a negative effect on this uh, growing boom of, in their economy at the moment. But it's just an effect of um, that new legislation. Um, finally, language and ease of communication. So there are three official languages of New Zealand, English, uh, New Zealand Sign Language, and the Maori language, which is the language of the Aborigines, which is like the native people to New Zealand. Um, they call their English Kiwi English, because as you might think it's just regular English, it's actually much quicker and contains much more slang than um, American English or British English would contain. Um, it's also considered somewhat hard to understand even for a native English speaker. Um, it contains also a lot of swearing, um, some things that you might, that other cultures might consider vulgar. Um, and again, lots of slang. So a couple examples, you might hear chili bin used as for in place of cooler. Uh, gum boots for rain boots. Mate is your friends. Uh, a bock is a casual holiday home by a beach or a river. Um, togs, swimwear. Sus means to figure it out. Tramping is hiking. And of course, Barbie is your barbecue. And that concludes our presentation. <laughs>